In this video, we're going to explore highlighting our enemies as well as targeting and moving towards the direction when we click on them. Once you've locked onto an enemy, you'll automatically follow them until you click on the ground to deselect them and remove the outline. Without further ado, let's jump right into the video. If you have your own enemy asset, feel free to skip this part. But for the purpose of this series, I'll be using Polytope's Medieval Plague Doctor asset. To get started, head to the asset page and click on the Add to My Assets. Or if you're already logged in, click on Open in Unity. Once you're in Unity, navigate the Package Manager tab and look for the Plague Doctor under Packages, My Asset. You should see a download button in the top right corner. If you've already downloaded the asset, all you need to do is hit Import. After importing the assets, you may notice that the bushes have changed color. However, this won't affect our project, so we can leave it as it is. To find the Plague Doctor prefab, navigate through the Polytope Studios folder. Drag the prefab, which is currently in a T-pose, into the game scene. Once it's in our scene, we'll unpack the prefab and rename it to Enemy. We'll then add a tag in a layer called Enemy and assign it to the game object. Adding a Capsule Collider to the game object comes next. We'll resize the collider to be larger than the model so that it's easier to highlight the enemy based on the collider. Now that we have our enemy set up, we need to update the movement script to make our player walk towards them. Open up the movement script on our player and make the following changes. First, create a header called enemy targeting just to separate the variables in the inspector. We'll need a public game object called target enemy and a public float named stopping distance. Ignore the layer mask variable. It's not needed in this script. The first thing we're gonna do is clean up our code and separate the script into different methods. Create a public void called rotation, which will store the vector three called look at position. Copy this line of code and paste it here changing the hit point into look at position. Next, create a public void named move to position, which will store another vector three named position. Copy and paste the movement code into here and change the hit point to position. Back to where we detect if the ray cast hit the ground, we'll call the move to position void here and store the hit dot point. Going back down to the move to position void, we'll call the rotation function and then store the position variable. On the if statement where we call the ground, write an else if statement where if the hit the collider is equal to enemy. We'll include the function here to get the player to move towards the enemy. Outside of the move method, name the new void to move towards enemy, which will store the game object called enemy. Let's have the target enemy equal to the enemy and set the agent.destination to the target enemy.transform.position, as well as having the agent.stopping distance being the stopping distance variable we created earlier. To have our player rotate, we'll call the rotation void that stores the target enemy dot transform the position. In the else if statement, we'll call this method and store the hit dot collider dot game object. That's pretty much all we need for our player to go towards the enemy when we click on them. In Unity, we will set the stopping distance to our inspector to 1.5, which I think is the best range for a melee attacker. When I press play and click on the enemy, the player will run towards the enemy's position and rotate quickly. Now you can keep this code as it is, but if I show you quickly, when I click on the enemy and move to my enemy position, the player won't follow the enemy, but instead will just go to the enemy's previous position. It's up to you if you want to keep it like this or not, but I personally like having my player follow the enemy while I still have them selected. This can be done quickly by adding these small lines of code to our movement script. Going back to Visual Studio, right outside where we get the mouse position, we'll write if enemy is not equal to null, have another if statement checking if the vector 3 distance of our player position and the target enemy position is greater than the stopping distance, meaning if we haven't stopped yet, we'll have the agent.set destination to the target enemy transform the position, making it chase the enemy until it's reached the stopping distance we declared. Going down to the move to position void, have an if statement where if target enemy is not equal to null, just simply set the target enemy equal to null. Back in Unity, when I press play, I move the enemy just a bit further. You can see when it walks towards the enemy, and when I move the enemy out of the way, the player will still follow and stay locked into the enemy until you right click something else or the ground. Now that we have the base functionality working, this part is also totally up to you. If you don't want to highlight your enemy when being selected, you won't need to follow along for this part. It would be nice adding a little indicator to know if you selected the enemy or not. We can achieve this by going to the Unity Asset Store once again and downloading this free asset called Quick Outline by Chris Nolan. Once you've downloaded it, we can add it into our Unity project by going to the Package Manager, looking for it, pressing Download, and then importing it. 
Shortly after importing the quick outline asset, click on the enemy game object and add the outline script. Here are the settings I have for it. The outline mode is set to outline visible. The outline color can be your choice, but I went for red. The same would go for the outline width, which I set it to 2.5. And finally, I tick the box where it says pre-compute outline. Next, let's create a script that disables the outline on start. We can remove the update method as we won't need it. We can define a private float called delay and set it to 0.01. We can also set a reference to the outline script with a variable named outline. In the start method, we get the outline component and we store it within the outline variable. Then we invoke a disable outline method with a delay float. The disabled outline method sets the outline's enabled property to false. And that's all we need for this script. In Unity, go to our player and we'll create a script called Highlight Manager that will manage the visual highlighting and selecting outlines of our enemy. We'll then need several variables for the script, including a private transform called Highlighted Object, another private transform called a Selected Object, a public layer mask called Selectable Layer, a private reference to the outline script called Highlight Outline, and a private raycast hit called Hit. We can remove the start method since we won't need it. Instead, in the update method, we will call a method named hover highlight, which will then create outside the update method. To create the hover highlight method, we'll make it public and add an if statement at the beginning. If the highlighted object isn't null, we will set the highlight outline enabled to false and set the highlighted object to null. We'll have a ray called ray, which is equal to the camera main dot screen points array with the input the mouse position. We also need to add this event system at the top of the script, so we'll import it by using Unity Engine Systems. Next, we'll create another if statement where we'll check if the event system isn't currently pointing at a game object, and if there's a physics ray cast that stores the ray, out hit, and selectable layer, and if so, we'll set the highlighted object equal to the hit.transform. We'll also write another if statement where we'll check if the highlighted object is an enemy and the highlighted object is not equal to the selected game object. If it's true, we'll get the outline component from the highlighted outline and set it to enabled true. Otherwise, we'll have the highlighted object equal to null. Let's create a public void named selected highlight outside of this method. Inside this function, we'll check if the highlighted object compare tag is enemy. Then we'll check if the selected object is not null. And if it's not null, we'll get the outline component of the selected object and enable it to false. We'll also set the selected object to hit transform and the outline component enabled to true. Lastly, we'll set the highlight outlines to be enabled to true, but with the highlighted object being null. This may sound confusing, but this is all we need for this method. Now let's create another public void called deselect highlight. The only lines we need here are to set the selected object outline enabled to false and also having the selected object to null. That's pretty much all we need for this script. However, we still need to call these two functions somewhere. Let's go back to Unity and onto our player. Set the selectable layer to enemy. Now, go back into the movement script in Visual Studio. We'll add a private highlight manager called HM script. And in the start method, we'll set it to the get component highlight manager. By gaining access to the highlight manager script, we can call these two functions we made earlier. Scroll down to the move to position method and in the if statement where it checks if the target is not null, write hm.deselect highlight. Similarly, in the move towards enemy method, instead of calling deselect, we'll call the hm script.selected highlight. Finally, we are done with highlighting our enemies. When playing the game scene, the enemy outline will appear in red when the mouse hovers over it. The same thing will happen if the enemy is selected by clicking on it. Clicking on the ground will also cause the outline to disappear and the enemy will be deselected from our player. To demonstrate this, I will test it out in the windowed mode. This way, it will be easier to see since the enemies are highlighted and their movements can be followed more easily. That is all for this episode. In the next one, we will be exploring creating a basic combat system from the player's end, including auto-attacking when in range based on an attack speed stat. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye!